Okay, guys, thought I'd uh, just jump on the mic, have a quick catch up. Just to kind of, I know Ant earlier in the briefing would have obviously covered off the market reaction to Powell and the dovish tilt to Powell's, Jerome Powell, Fed Chair's comments yesterday. <clears throat> but I thought I'd come on and just add a little bit to it. So, um, <clears throat> just just firstly reviewing the charts, and, and uh, obviously, may, in the main, markets are still right up there around the extreme sort of area of the moves from yesterday. So, um, draw a red box here on the euro dollar because the uh, big explosion higher. Um, Certainly, this, this dollar weakness driving the euro dollar exchange rate sharply up. And here we are actually right now trading, you know, right at the top end of that range from yesterday. So, um, so you know, definitely dollar weakness, but no, no real extension and follow through yet today. We're up here trading at yesterday's extremes, but as it stands, uh, really catching resistance. Uh, back at the high point from Monday, and that's kind of just killed it um, for now. Um, so no extension on yesterday's gains. Yesterday's gains were large-ish, though, large-ish. It's not a massive move. I mean, uh, we didn't even make a new high for the week. Or, uh, sorry, I guess technically we did, actually, but by, a, like, five pips or something. So, you know, in the end, we moved from the 113 handle to the 114 handle. It was a 100-pip move, which... You know, for a major Fed chair speech, isn't isn't massive. Um, let's have a look at gold. So this is the gold move. I'd say relatively is bigger in that gold did make a new high for the week because Monday's double. Oh, sorry, that's Tuesday's high. No apologies. Yeah, sorry, it's the same, isn't it? This is Monday's high. So gold didn't make a new high for the week either. Um, it did spike, uh, what is that, $16, and we hit the high point from, let me just move that line, we hit the high point from Monday, and that well, we didn't quite get there, and then that killed it, we had a 50% retracement, but here we are now, trading around the highs from yesterday's spike, okay, on the equity front. Let's go to that 60 minute time frame like the other charts. So here, you know, same same scenario on the one hand in that the S&P is trading at levels that we were trading last night after that move. But for stocks, it's definitely the case that um, definitely we made new highs for the week, clearly. And if you go to the daily chart, um, new high for the week. But, you know, in the end, it was this this resistance if I draw the line there, this kind of triple top that we had, 14th, 16th, 19th of November. It's kind of just um, capped, capped things now. So the point I'm saying here by looking across these markets is that decent size moves yesterday, but no further extensions today. So I wanted to maybe explore the idea as to why that might be the case. Now... Let's talk about the current sort of probabilities of the Federal Reserve hiking interest rates in 2019, because this is the big topic. We're nailed on for the Fed to hike rates for a fourth time this year, and that's going to happen in two weeks' time, okay? Um, or three weeks' time. Now, that, that's locked in, really. Something extraordinary has got to happen at the G20 summit over the weekend, something extraordinarily bad for the December hike to, to be taken off the table. So it's definitely more about a 2019 story for markets. How many times will the Fed hike in 2019? And just as a reminder um, of the interest rate hiking cycle so far, um, it has been speeding up. Um, so looking at this chart on trading economics one hike december 2015 so one hike in 2015 one hike in 2016 three hikes in 2017 four hikes assuming they hike in december four hikes in 2018 so that that curve's been steepening but as that 
whole concern around sustainability of growth, US and globally has kind of gathered speed, that, that whole risk that maybe we've peaked. So Powell's come on and, and tried to be more dovish yesterday and, and tried to kind of steer our expectations lower for the number of hikes the Fed might uh, put through the system in 2019, right? So it's all about 2019 expectations. So here's a really good chart, which is tracking actually interest rate hike expectations for 2019 and interest rate hike expectations for 2020. Now let's look at the, the white line first. Now the white line, look, this is the spread. It's the euro dollar spread between the December 2018 contract and the December 2019 contract. And it's looking at the, the, the difference in percentage points on this spread comparing the end of this year to the end of next year. So in other words, the spread is really representing the number of rate hikes in 2019. And as you can see, this white line, ever since we kind of peaked in, in October, this white line's come sharply lower. Now it peaked up at 0 0.6, so that means that the spread between deck 18 and deck 19 was 0.6%. Now because the Fed hike in 25 basis point increments, so 0.25% each time, well, a 0.6% spread is actually, that we, that's pricing just over two rate hikes in 2019. So even when things were at their most bullish uh, a couple of months back and, you know, the Fed were being hawkish, um, actually market pricing didn't get to pricing three hikes next year. So that, that's one thing to note that market pricing here has always been a lot more dovish than the Fed have been communicating. So maybe one of the reasons why market reaction, yes, was decent yesterday, but no follow through today, is because really markets were priced for less than three hikes, even at the, the height of this growth momentum um, back in the summer. So what's happened in the last couple of months is this white line's not only gone down below 0.5%, it's actually, it's now down, as of last night, it's now down to 0.25%. Believe it or not, the euro dollar market is currently pricing now just one hike in 2019. When in 2019? Well, that's debatable. First half would be the idea, right? So do understand that market pricing is very dovish now. Look at, 20, look at the 2020 line. So the 2020 line pretty much all year has been down um, at point, 0 0.1 or less. And here we are now officially below zero, but it's basically on zero. So what the euro dollar market is telling us, it's telling us they're priced for one hike in 2019 and zero hikes in 2020. Basically one more hike in this hiking cycle. So that would basically be, well, sorry, that's not including the hike that's expected in three weeks. So really, two more hikes left in the cycle. One in December coming up, and then one in 2019. So that would take rates to 2.75%. This is according to market pricing. That's definitely lower than the Fed's dot plot matrix. But this now turns my attention back to what Powell said last night, and perhaps the critical comment or line or sentence was that we are just below the neutral rate. Now, why is that important? So this whole neutral rate, that's the level of interest rates that the Fed think will lead to an economic system that is neither accelerating in expansion nor decelerating in expansion. It's the optimum interest rate to deliver sustained economic growth, okay? The neutral rate. So the top of the cycle is the neutral rate, okay? Now, in previous cycles, they've often got it wrong in that they've hiked rates too far. Rates have gone too high. And in the end, with hindsight, it was clear that actually they hiked over and above the neutral rate. So then rates were too high and that had a drag on the economy and it tipped it into a recession. Um, 
So this is what the neutral rate means. Now, why was Powell's comment yesterday so surprising and why did markets move quite rapidly in the way they did? It's really because of how Powell has changed his message. Because if you go back to the start of October, Powell said, we are nowhere near the neutral rate. Powell's words. That is after they'd hiked in September. So he said this in October. Interest rates in October are the same level as interest rates are now in America. Start of October, he said, we are nowhere near the neutral rate. And then he turns up yesterday and he says, we are just below the neutral rate. Now, that's a pretty big change in opinion from the Fed chair. He's got to be a little bit careful, I think, Mr. Powell. Now, there's a conspiracy theory that is linking his change in message to um, due to Donald Trump and due to the G20 summit. Um, I, I don't necessarily buy into this conspiracy theory, but basically some are saying that he's become more dovish just before the G20 so that it removes Trump's um, go-to excuse for why the stock market has dropped so sharply. Because Trump's been blaming the Fed and blaming the Fed and blaming the Fed. In fact, just this week, well, before his speech yesterday, he was saying, Trump was saying, I am not happy at all with Jay's performance since I picked him. Um, so here now, Powell's turned dovish, maybe to remove that excuse for Trump so that he's going into the G20 summit knowing that if he just puts fuel to the flames of this trade war risk and if he starts shouting and blaming and threatening and they come out of the G20 summit with no progress, in fact, the reverse and this whole trade war ris risk um, escalates, well then, yeah, the S&P is going to go down. And at that point, Trump can't blame the Fed because, well, the Fed has just turned dovish. So then the blame is entirely at his door. He's the aggressor towards China, and that alone is leading to the stock market dropping. And because he's so obsessed with the level of the stock market as a barometer for the success of his administration, uh, perhaps he's left a bit naked. And therefore, Powell is turned dovish just before the G20 so that Trump kind of has to make some kind of progress towards a future deal with China on trade. That's a bit of a conspiracy theory. Um, I think more likely Powell's just caved a little bit under the relentless criticism from the White House and has maybe just toned it down. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's harsh. Maybe he has looked at the data and, is, and thinks it's now it is appropriate. But my, my point is you can't go from saying we're nowhere near the neutral rate to then saying we're just below the neutral rate. You can't make that change in six weeks without damaging your credibility. So this comes to my final point. Credibility is key for a central bank. That basically means when you say something about future guidance, markets and people believe you. You, know, you have to be credible. That's actually one of the mechanisms that makes monetary policy most effective, forward guidance. It's guiding the economic system as to what interest rates are going to be in the future. And this is important when you're, let's say, a business owner, for example. You know, are you looking to borrow and invest in your, in your business's growth? Yes or no? Well, there's a lot of factors involved in that decision, but one of them might be the cost of debt. And is there any kind of visibility on how expensive debt will be in the future? And this is what the Fed's forward guidance is all about. But then if the Fed are prone to changing their mind quite dramatically in short spaces of time, well then our trust in their forward guidance gets eroded. And that itself can be literally in itself be a negative for economic growth. So there's one other big kind of big gun central banker that's built a reputation for himself in terms of changing his mind. Uh, I wonder if anybody knows who I might be referring to. 
the who, who else is being considered as as unreliable as a central bank chief? Type in the room if you know who I'm talking about. I'll give you thirty seconds. Good, not not Draghi, Andrew. It's it's Mr. Carney, and I'm gonna and watch this, watch this. I'm just gonna go to Google. Okay, I haven't set this up. Go to Google, just Google unreliable boyfriend. <laughs> Nothing else, just Google unreliable boyfriend, and hit enter. Picture of Sam. The <laughs> Picture of Sam North is not the result. The second natural result is the BBC article, Is Carney an Unreliable Boyfriend? He's built a reputation from him for himself. This goes back to like 2017, really, into, into the start of this year, <coughs> where he quite dramatically changed his mind and his stance and his guidance, going from very hawkish to all of a sudden very dovish in a short space of time. Um, so the unreliable boyfriend is Mark Carney. So I was just talking to Ant about this. So perhaps we should um, start a new trend here. And given Jerome is a little bit older than Mr. Carney, Jerome Powell, perhaps, um, perhaps this is the beginning of the, the unreliable granddad. Uh, we're, we're coining the phrase. Uh, let's Google search that. Unreliable grandparents. When you, when your parents suck as grandparents, okay. Um, I won't I won't click into any of these just in case. Um, but yeah, you heard it here first. Um, Jerome Powell, hashtag unreliable granddad. Let's get that trending. 